Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right? It's not quite the top of the hour, but the pizza's gone, so at that time we generally start. It is my distinct privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Nick Cost. We're colleagues and become friends. Uh, Nick has got, I think, a very interesting training history. Did your undergraduate at Vanderbilt, went to medical school at Emory, and then so it's quite unique for Nick, which was to do training such that you're boarded both an adult and pediatric uh, urology, which is a pretty unique thing. And I think uh, that situates Dr. Koss very well for this topic of uh, adolescent and testes cancer. So as a geomedical oncologist, um, most of these patients are managed by the surgeons. Unfortunately, advanced cases come our way and so forth. But uh, it's a great model for multidisciplinary clinical care. It's a fascinating part of medicine because we do so well, meaning combined surgery, uh, chemotherapy, and so forth. So without any further ado, Dr. Koss. Well, thanks, Tom, for that very kind introduction. And uh, as, uh, as Tom mentioned, um, with my interest really is in uh, children, adolescents, and young adults with urologic malignancy, mostly in the realm of testis and kidney cancer. So I split my time between uh, children's and the cancer center here. And uh, one of my main interests is uh, testis cancer, where that disease really overlaps this age group. So testis cancer is the most common solid tumor in uh, men from the ages of 13 to 39. Despite you telling me to do that, I didn't manage to do that. And so uh, I uh, really spent a lot of my time helping to manage these patients and mostly doing outcomes-based research, which will be reflected in this talk. And I understand most of the time for this uh, specific venue, it's more typically uh, lab-based research, translational research. So I hope uh, I won't bore you too much with clinical uh, outcomes research. But if there are any questions at any point, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I'd love to take uh, any questions that you might have. I don't have any disclosures uh, as far as the objectives of the talk. I'd like to, at the end, uh, have you be able to understand what the spectrum of testicular malignancies look like between children, adolescents, and young adults, and then understand why, or at least why we think that adolescents with testis cancer don't do as well as either their pediatric or adult counterparts and then uh, what maybe we can do in the future to optimize outcomes in this population. So as a bit of background, testicular tumors can happen in males from any age, from infancy through older adulthood. Um, they account for around 2% of all uh, tumors in male children under the age of 14, but that goes up quite a bit. And as I've mentioned, in uh, adolescence, it represents the most common solid tumor that we see. Uh, as they get a little bit older, between 30 and 45 or 49, it represents around 7% uh, of all malignancies. Uh, just because of the overall numbers of patients, that's still the largest group, but uh, incidence-wise, not quite as high. Uh, as far as the kind of testicular tumors, it's really important to think about what the testicle does. So it has two main functions. It makes sperm and it makes hormones, uh, testosterone mostly. The cells that go on to make sperm are germ cells, and uh, that is the majority of what testicular tumors come from. And it makes sense because you know, these are cells that are relatively rapidly dividing, even in a physiologic state. They're pre-programmed to become another person, so they're a little uh, already tripped to become malignant. And so they represent 95% of, um, of testicular tumors. And uh, here in red, I've highlighted they make important uh, hormones that we then use as serum tumor markers, alpha ketoprotein and beta HCG. They're divided mostly into uh, seminomas and non-seminomas, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And that's really going to be the focus of the talk today. The other uh, kinds of testicular tumors you can see are related then to the hormonal function of the testicle. So the cells that uh, support the germ cells and make testosterone, these are stromal tumors. They're generally uh, very uh, low mitotic rate just at baseline and so less likely to become uh, a malignant tumor, but they're made up of a number of different cell types that you can see here. As a lot of the talk we'll focus on today has to do with how adolescents with testis cancer and germ cell tumors specifically vary from their other counterparts. Um, here I'd just like to hit a couple of bullet points before we get too far into it about how patients before puberty differ from those after puberty, specifically in the adolescent age. So in childhood, before puberty, the vast majority of the tumors are actually benign, while after puberty the most are malignant. Uh, as far as the types of cells uh, before puberty, most of the time the malignant types are represented by yolk sac tumors, potentially teratomas, whereas afterwards in adolescence the most common type we see is a pure embrinal carcinoma, 
or if not a pure uh, embryonal tumor, then often a mixed non-seminoma histology. As far as the metastatic potential, it's very uncommon in the malignant tumors before puberty. Only about 5% of patients will have spread. However, uh, those after puberty, at least a third would present with metastatic disease. And as far as teratoma, so you're even dealing with the same uh, histologic subtype, while in a prepubertal patient that's uniformly benign in uh, uh, adults or adolescents, it's usually seen not as a pure form, uh, but as part of a mixed histology and generally can be uh, malignant. As far as the prognosis, as Dr. Flagg mentioned, fortunately, uh, the vast majority of these patients do extremely well. You can see here, this is some uh, SEER data looking at uh, overall survival for patients with testis cancer by age. And uh, in the prepuber patients, we're very fortunate that well over 95% of them will survive. And uh, while overall uh, a solid tumor having survival in the 80s and 90s is great, uh, you can see there's quite a dip here when you hit this adolescent age group. And uh, we'll focus a bit on that. Uh, to give you some background, we'll talk first about what we do for the patients that do the best, the children before puberty, and uh, go through some of the clinical approach to these patients. So generally when they present, and they're noted to have a testicular tumor, we uh, work them up with serum tumor markers trying to get an idea potentially what elements of the of, uh, histology are available. Um, we then do staging imaging looking specifically at their retroperitoneum because that's the most common place where these uh, tumors will spread. That may seem counterintuitive. Many people think the testicle, it's in the scrotum, so if it's gonna spread, maybe it would go to inguinal lymph nodes. However, the testicle develops in utero up near the kidneys, and it's only during the last few weeks of gestation that it descends down into the scrotum. So even though it resides in the scrotum and, and uh, during life, the blood supply, the blood drainage, the lymphatic drainage all still drains to near the kidneys and the retroperitoneum. So that's where we're focusing most of our attention as far as when it spreads. As far as the surgical approach, uh, we generally, again, approach it through an, an inguinal incision, and this has to do with the anatomy and the fact, again, that the blood supply comes from the retroperitoneum down into the scrotum, so the inguinal canal allows us to get and deliver the testicle up, but also get a little higher on the blood supply. One of the interesting things, and I just find this interesting because I like physiology, is the fact that uh, when you're looking at patients when they're very young, you have to think about what are their physiologic baselines for some of these labs. So, for example, alpha fetoprotein is physiologically elevated uh, in the first few weeks and months of life. So sometimes people will get a, a new patient, a pediatrician will have some patient that has a testic testicular tumor they see in the office, they'll draw a lab, and then they'll call very frantic saying the AFP levels are 40,000. But depending on how old they are, that could be completely normal. Uh, there's actually uh, some data to indicate at what age and at what level can actually be normal, and there are nomograms for this sort of thing. As far as, again, the way we manage them, though, in general, for testicular tumors that we think are malignant, they undergo a radical orchiectomy where we're removing the entire testicle and spermatic cord. However, there are so many patients that don't have malignant uh, histology in the prepubertal group, we've tried to avoid uh, the more aggressive surgery by removing the whole testicle by just removing the tumor, and we term that very novelly testicular sparing surgery. Uh, some of the things that are important to, to be able to do in that setting is that you have a pathologist that's willing to look at a frozen section intraoperatively so that you can understand what's going on in real time so that if you need to do a completion radical orchiectomy that you can. And in general, if there are concerns, we would shade towards being more aggressive and removing the entire testicle. Here are a few clinical pictures. So this is a patient who's about three months old that had a testicular tumor that was picked up on exam by the pediatrician and ultrasound confirmed it. However, because the markers were all normal, at least for this child's age, it was felt that uh, it was very likely this would be a benign tumor, and so uh, testis sparing would be possible. So in this case, you can see we've delivered the testicle out through an inguinal incision. I think there's a way that I can do this here. So this has been delivered through an inguinal incision. This is the testicular the spermatic cord and down to the testicle itself. And so in this case, making an incision and then ex uh, basically excising just the tumor we can then put the remaining part of the testicle back together and, and re-deliver it into the scrotum. And overall, the, the child, other than a scar in the inguinal canal, really wouldn't have any noticeable difference between the two sides of the hemiscrotum. In that case, the, the tumor was a uh, teratoma, which again, before puberty, is considered benign, so they don't need any further uh, therapy. As far as the postpubertal management, if they've not already had staging imaging, specifically, again, looking at the retroperitoneum, we would do that. And then we follow the serum tumor markers. And again, this is where physiology is very important to understand. And the fact that these markers, just because the testicle and the testicular tumor may make them, 
and you remove the testicle, they're not going to then just vanish overnight. In general, these tumor markers take time to break down. So, for example, beta HCG has a half life of around 24 to 36 hours in AFP between five and seven days. So, it can take maybe even up to a month or six weeks for those to return to normal levels, depending on how high they were beforehand. And so, understanding the trending the kinetics of the tumor markers can be important. As far as the way we stage them, this is something that uh, is where we run into problems where the left hand and the right hand don't talk to each other. So, in the pediatric world, most tumors are staged by the uh, children's cooperative group, the children's oncology group, while in adults, most tumors are staged through the AJCC system. And while, in general, they overlap, there are times where they don't. And then if our treatment recommendations are based on staging, you can imagine scenarios, and we'll talk about a few, where patients can uh, more or less fall through the cracks and maybe not get the treatment that they need. But in the prepubertal patients, staging under the children's oncology group staging system a stage one tumor is essentially one that's had the testicle removed that included the tumor. There's no evidence of any other disease. The markers all return to normal. Stage two would be patients that have microscopic residual or elevated tumor markers. And this includes patients that are uh, approached what we would consider inappropriately from a surgical standpoint, so a transcrotal orchiectomy as opposed to an inguinal orchiectomy. Stage three disease are patients that have retroperitoneal lymph node involvement. And stage four disease are patients that have distant non-nodal metastatic disease. As far as what we do for the patients after they've been diagnosed and treated surgically, uh, it's very important, as Dr. Flake mentioned, these are patients that are ideally managed in a multidisciplinary manner. Uh, there are important roles for surgery, for uh, chemotherapy, for potentially even radiation. And so uh, it's, it's most appropriate that these patients be managed by a group of experts from all of those fields. As far as the way we generally manage them, however, patients that have just stage one tumors, we try very hard uh, to encourage them just to undergo surveillance. By that, I mean we're just going to follow them with imaging, looking at their markers, because any treatment they would get is probably over-treatment in at least 50 or 60 percent of the case, cases. While some will recur, we're very fortunate that they're all salvageable for the most part when they do recur, and so um, we very much want to spare uh, any therapy that's unneeded for patients by uh, encouraging them to just follow along closely after surgery. However, if they do have metastatic disease, uh, uh, chemotherapy uh, has been proven to be extremely effective in these patients. And uh, again, as far as the difference between children and adults, uh, because of the, some of the toxicities of the chemotherapeutic agents, uh, the regimens vary a bit. While they may look very similar on the surface, for example, in adult testis cancer, the, the real backbone of treatment is BEP, bleomycin, Etoposide and cisplatin. Uh, in children, uh, because the bleomycin is known to be very pulmonary toxic, they, uh, they try to avoid that, and so they use a lower dose. They change the mnemonic a bit and call it PEB. So they get only the uh, day one uh, dosing of bleomycin. And while that sounds like a small, a nuanced difference, there are data that then adult patients or adolescents who, for all intents and purposes, are adults, if they're getting treated with this pediatric regimen and not getting all the bleomycin dosing, we'll present some data in a bit that their outcomes are not as good. So important to understand that, again, you know, children are not just little adults. Uh, and as I've just mentioned here, the difference between PEB and BEP. As far as after chemotherapy, fortunately, many of the times any metastatic disease that they have is completely resolved by chemotherapy. However, if it's, if it's not and there are residual, there's residual disease after the chemotherapy, uh, very important for these patients to undergo surgery. We see here, because of being a tertiary referral center, we see cases where patients have gotten chemotherapy and not everything went away, and you maybe have a, a medical oncologist practicing by themselves, not with a multidisciplinary environment, and talking to a urologist, and they say, well, there's something still there, we should give more chemo, and you know, we see people that end up with twice or two and a half times the amount of chemotherapy they ever needed. And in reality, after that first line of chemo, what they needed was surgery. So um, obviously, I'm biased at being a surgeon, but the reality is, is that you know, if uh, all you have uh, is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And that's why it's important to you know, have people from all of these disciplines working together and chiming in on what their relative roles are. Uh, a good example of that is, is that after they've started chemotherapy, if they haven't had a complete response, specifically with their serum tumor markers, Surgery is not the right answer, and so a second line of chemotherapy is indicated. And there are even cases where we can still salvage them if they've had multiple relapses or progressions with the high-dose chemotherapy and bone marrow, bone marrow transplant. As far as the prognosis, 
Uh, for patients that uh, were stage one and they don't get any adjuvant therapy, uh, there are two studies that have shown that they have quite a great outcome. Uh, in the prepubertal population, only about 18%, so 20% is the easy number to remember, recurred. So the six-year event-free survival was 82%, and the overall survival was 100%. So what that means is that 18% that recurred, they were all salvaged with chemotherapy at that point. So if you're talking to a patient or a family about this, what you essentially are telling them is that in your, in your case, I would have to treat four patients, uh, excuse me, five patients to really only treat the one that needed it if I was giving them adjuvant therapy. So that's why we push very hard for, well, let's just wait to see if you're one of the five that's going to recur. And if you are, then we know we can cure you at that point. This is just a Kaplan-Meier curve showing the same thing. Basically, the black line below is the event-free survival, and the dashed line is overall survival. And one of the things to note here is, is that all these recurrences or events are essentially happening in the first two years. And that's important, too, for kind of psychological standpoint, explain to a patient, well, during this period of time, we're going to follow you very closely. We should know in pretty short order whether you're going to recur or you're not. We don't necessarily keep them on the hot seat for 10 or 20 years. But it's important to realize that these data are only dealing with prepubertal patients. So uh, it, it can be... Uh, and it's important to understand you can't extrapolate this necessarily to older patients. And uh, we'll talk a bit about that more in a moment. As far as the other patients that were on this study, so those that had uh, some residual disease, they had 100% event-free and overall survival with chemotherapy. Uh, the stage 3 patients, there's actually a couple of different studies that have looked at this. Again, 100% overall survival. And even in the distant metastatic setting, over 90% of the patients were cured. So from that, the next generation of studies in the children's oncology group uh, wanted to expand on that great success. And so what they decided to do was push the age uh, up a little bit. So they wanted to start to include some adolescents. And also they wanted to expand it from just testicular germ cell tumors and also include ovarian germ cell tumors. And so in doing that, they were expecting the similar outcomes. Uh, unfortunately, this study had to be stopped early because it met its, uh, its stopping rules such that the analysis showed what was considered to be an un acceptable event-free survival such that less than 70% 70 per, 70 of the patients at three years had an event-free survival. And so uh, looking back, what, what caused that? Well, as you can imagine, when you change something, that's usually what's going to uh, cause the, the difference. And so what we saw is both ovarian germ cell tumors didn't perform as well as testicular germ cell tumors, and the adolescent testis, uh, tumors did not do as well as the pediatric ones. And uh, that's spawned two articles. One uh, looked at the ovarian experience, and you can see here on the Kaplan-Meier curve, uh, the yellow line indicating event-free survival for stage 1 ovarian tumors was at about 50%. So around half of those patients will recur. Unfortunately, they were almost all salvaged. So it's not necessarily a failure of the approach. It's more of a just trying to understand what the numbers look like so you can counsel these patients appropriately. Similarly, for the, uh, for the testis uh, uh, patients, the overall experience was quite good, but if you break it down by age, what they found was that those patients that were 11 years or older, similarly to the ovarian experience, about 50% event-free survival. So they're just higher risk for relapse, but again, that they can all be salvaged. So in general, the message as we conclude this part of the talk about the patients before puberty, uh, I think the, the, the treatment guidelines are very well established and make sense, and, and, and that's borne out by the data. The stage one patients should be observed that patients that have stage 2 or greater disease should get uh, uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. But there are some room for improvement. Um, there are concerns about some of the cisplatin toxicity as it relates to both uh, the uh, hearing as well as to uh, future renal function. And there is uh, interest in uh, substituting the cisplatin for carboplatin among the pediatric patients. And there's actually a trial that uh, is working its way through Scientific Council right now that will randomize between carboplatin and cisplatin. And similarly, for the stage 4 patients, as I showed, while 91% is quite good, there is hope that maybe that can be approved on. And so the next plan for the younger patients with distant metastatic disease, that will include uh, the typical regimen of bleomycin, etoposide, and platinum, but will also add taxol. So transitioning then to adolescents, so now the patients that are uh, basically pubertal or postpubertal, and I'll remind you about this uh, data, these data here that indicate the inferior survival compared to their older, their younger counterparts. And one of the questions is, is what we're seeing in testis cancer just reflective of adolescents and young adults with cancer in general? 
So this is a uh, more SEER data that's looked at, excuse me, looked at the change in overall survival over, over time based on patient's age. And you can see here that we're making great strides in the prepubital patients overall. We're also, I think, despite maybe what you hear on the news or whatnot, we are making ground on adults uh, with cancer overall. However, you can see here that the progress really lags in this group that we term AYA, or adolescent and young adult. And there's been more emphasis on this age group, not just in testis cancer, but overall. Uh, there is thoughts that maybe the, the decrease uh, in outcomes is relative to just so societal factors. For example, are they caught between pediatric providers and adult providers? You know, I, I'm sure you can appreciate some 18-year-olds uh, would be more comfortable going to a children's hospital. Uh, some 17-year-olds may feel more comfortable going to an adult institution. However, based on what their tumor biology is, what their disease is, they may be better off treated at one or the other, really regardless of what their age is. Um, and so I want to drill down a little bit on that, specifically in testicular cancer. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of data out there. And part of the problem is, is that uh, this group isn't covered by most adult trial designs. Uh, looking at clinical trial and eligibility criteria, almost uniformly, it's going to be for patients that are 18 years or older. And very common for pediatric trials, they may be only open to patients before puberty. So uh, part of the problem is, is you just can't capture these patients. Uh, I would put forth at least my hypothesis, and I think is borne out by the data, is that the adolescents with testis cancer after puberty, it's a different entity and has a different outcome. In general, as we've already shown, the, the prognosis is thought to be worse. And some of it is thought to be because of the histology. Rather than pure uh, yolk sac tumor, for example, now you're dealing with mixed uh, non-seminomous histologies that generally are thought to be more aggressive. Additionally, they present at higher stage. And some institutional data from when I was a fellow at UT Southwestern we looked at, in that group of adolescents, we found that only a third were stage one at diagnosis. So over you know, over 60% of them had presented with metastatic disease, which is a lot higher than we think of either for children or even for adults. And this is typical for what we would see. This is somebody that comes in and says, oh, this just popped up over the last week. I think we can probably all appreciate that this has probably not just been going on for a week, but uh, adolescent and young adult men are not exactly the most reliable historians. They're very prone to wanting to uh, minimize any problems they have. And since it's, a, it's something that's a very private problem, it may not be something that's just going to show itself without the, the patient themselves wanting to present to the physician. Uh, and this is, again, the surgical approach just revealing how large this tumor was. As we've talked about before, because of the embryology uh, of this tumor and the testis as it develops, when it spreads, for example, for this patient, what you end up with is, is all this metastatic disease around the aorta. And so, Part of the treatment, and then is, uh, is what's called a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, where we've removed all of the lymph nodes around the inferior vena cava and the aorta. And, and uh, well, I don't know if it projects well, this actually choked off the IVC so much that it ended up having to get all of its venous blood returned through uh, what was formerly a lumbar vein that was probably um, you know half the size of your pinky. But because of that being choked off by the tumor, it ended up being larger than the inferior vena, vena cava itself. Sometimes we'll have people come in and say, well, I'm not really sure, is this patient before puberty or they after puberty? Understand that that uh, can be slightly difficult during a certain age group to distinguish. However, uh, testicular germ cell tumors are actually very rare in that immediately peripubertal age group. Uh, we looked at the data from the children's oncology group, looked similarly at the experience from the UK, and we didn't find a single case of a patient between the ages of 8 and 11 that had uh, a testicular germ cell tumor. So it's probably not really that much of a clinical entity. And if they do have a testis tumor, it's very likely that it's probably a stromal tumor or something that's benign, so can change the way you think about it a bit. And if you're in doubt, then generally recommend using Tanner staging, which is a well-defined uh, staging system that looks at pubic hair and testicular development to decide whether they're pre- or uh, peripubertal. As far as the clinical approach, it's very similar in the sense that we're going to be looking at tumor markers. We're going to be looking at the retroperitoneum for staging. But one of the things that's different is the fact that now that they're pubertal, uh, talking about sperm preservation, fertility preservation, um, in general, there are fewer indications for, for partial orchiectomy once they get uh, around this age. Um, as far as the fertility preservation, this is something that I'm interested in and, and something that I'll just talk about for a moment. And I think it's, uh, in a sense, an ethical issue. And it's interesting because people look at it 
ethically from two different standpoints. Some people say, oh, these are uh, compromised minors, even though they're pubertal and they can produce sperm. Uh, it's, it's, un, excuse me, it's unethical to talk about uh, fertility preservation with them because they don't really understand the concepts. I would actually say that it's unethical to not talk about it. Now, they can decide, they and their parents may decide they don't want to go forward with that, but I think everybody deserves at least the option to talk about it. Uh, there's an enormous amount of data that talk about decisional regret for patients, especially in a disease like this that's so curable. The fact is that you're making a decision when you're 16, 17, 18 about something that's not going to really impact you until maybe you're 30 and you want to have children. When they're first diagnosed, all they want to do is be cured. They don't really take the time to think, well, in 15 years, am I going to want to have kids? Is this going to impact my ability to have kids? And uh, they've done focus groups with both parents and patients when they've gotten older, and over 90% uh, report regret and not pursuing fertility preservation. And it's something that can actually be done fairly easily. If they're old enough that they can provide a, a sperm sample, that can be banked. But if not, uh, there are things we can do. We're taking out one of the testicles. Most of the testicle itself is not affected by the tumor itself, you can actually biopsy and take some of that, uh, that tissue from the testis and cryopreserve it for future use. Um, getting back to just our general clinical approach, again, after surgery, if we haven't staged them, we would then at that point. And then this is where we're going to get to what we talked about before as far as the discrepancy between the AJCC staging system for adults and the COG staging for children. Uh, in general, I think most people would agree now that if they're you know, pubertal, post-pubertal, they really should be managed, uh, at least guidelines-wise, as adults. So using the AJCC staging and the National Conference of Cancer Network guidelines. But here's an example of a discrepancy. So this was a patient of mine a few years ago. He was 15 years old. He came in with a right mixed non-seminomatous germ cell tumor. <clears throat> he had local invasion through his lymphovascular channels, um, but he had negative margins, confined at least the best that we could tell to his testicle. He had a, a mixed histology with some embryonal carcinoma, teratoma, and seminoma. But on his staging imaging, he had uh, almost two centimeter lymph node right near his IVC, which is a very common place for the right testicle to drain. So in an adult system, we would classify him as clinical node uh, positive, And uh, his tumor markers then uh, normalized, so he didn't have any evidence of that. And so he had options. Now, if he had been... Uh, managed according to the COG guidelines, they don't recognize lymphadenopathy until it gets to be two centimeters. So they would have called this patient stage one and they would have watched him. And I think that that's part of what may account for such the low rate of event-free survival that we talked about with the stage one adolescents earlier. I think a lot of patients are being inappropriately staged. But if you were to use an adult system with the AJCC uh, staging system, this would be a patient that has 2A disease and would be offered adjuvant therapy, either chemotherapy or an RPLMD. Uh, while we don't generally use PET scans, this patient actually got one, and I think it, it points out nicely, you can see this very pet avid area in the retroperitoneum that lines up uh, perfectly with that node we saw before. So this patient elected to uh, undergo an RPLND, retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, so you can see here uh, his, uh, excuse me, his, uh, all the lymphatic and uh, tissue around his inferior vena cava and his aorta have been removed. This is the left renal vein going over to the kidney over here. And this is the bifurcation of the aorta and the IVC. This patient did have that one node positive, as we had seen before. And uh, at that point, he was confirmed as a stage 2A. He was offered either adjuvant uh, chemotherapy or surveillance. He had elected for surgery because he wanted to avoid chemotherapy. And he's uh, two and a half years out now from surgery and no evidence of recurrence. And so we would consider for uh, all intents and purposes cured at this point, even though we'll continue to watch him for a little bit. But, you know, he appreciated the opportunity to be diagnosed, to have the treatment all in a timely manner rather than necessarily having to wait for it to come back. Now, he probably would have had the same outcome as far as cure, but uh, when you deal with a disease like testis cancer where so many patients are cured, you have to take into account other things like the patient's uh, mental well-being, their, their quality of life. And, uh, you know, patients that are on surveillance, if it can be avoided and they can be treated actively if they need that, in many cases, that treats their anxiety as well. Uh, we then, uh, in general, will follow up these patients looking mark at markers, which we know uh, can guide whether it's re recurred or not. Um, there are some studies that are available as far as investigational studies that we can offer to them. Um, for example, there's a, a study that just highlights some of the things that we potentially can do. This is for patients with very advanced disease. Uh, 
uh, multi-institution cooperative trial that was originally designed to only include patients that were 18 or older. However, because of some lobbying by people involved with the Children's Oncology Group, they've actually reduced their age criteria to 14 years and older. And it's just a, an example of the kind of advocacy that we can do for these patients, potentially to get them in, included on clinical trials. Uh, as far as management of these patients, when they hit the adolescent and young adult group, uh, we'll be focusing mostly on non-seminomas because seminoma is very, very rare in this patient population and generally can be managed as adults. So for patients that have clinical stage one disease in the uh, adolescent and young adult group, they can be either offered surveillance, which we recommend for most patients. They can undergo a primary retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, which serves two purposes, both to stage whether they've had spread and also to treat it if it has, or they can undergo a limited cycle chemotherapy regimen. If after the orchiectomy, they don't have any evidence of disease on the radiology, but they have elevated serum tumor markers, they enter the special status that we call stage 1S, where we think that the markers must be up because they just haven't had time yet to manifest a radiologically evident mass, but this marker has to be coming from somewhere, and so most recommend active treatment for those patients. As far as the patients that have low-volume metastatic disease, if their markers are negative, they have a couple of options. They can either get chemotherapy or a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, as the patient we mentioned before did. However, in general, we think of patients, if they've got serum marker uh, positive disease after orchiectomy, we recommend chemotherapy as it's more likely to be uh, spread not just to the retroperitoneum, but also outside of it. And uh, again, surgery in the retroperitoneum in the form of RPLND is only going to treat disease that's there. If it's outside of that already into the lungs or whatnot, then you, know, you really need systemic therapy. Once it gets to be a little bit more advanced disease, so higher tumor markers or larger nodal mats or a radiologic evidence of pulmonary disease, hepatic disease, so forth and so on, then really no role for surgery at that point. Chemotherapy is indicated uh, with surgery being reserved for after chemotherapy if they have normal markers but a residual mass. If there's no residual mass after chemotherapy, which happens in probably 40 or 50 percent of patients, then they won't require a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection at all. And as I tell a lot of these patients, while I really like to operate and it's a big part of what I do, uh, this surgery is morbid and, and you know, we're not in the business of doing it on patients that don't need it. Unfortunately, the data has borne out that if patients respond completely both as far as their tumor markers and imaging, uh, if they've responded completely to chemotherapy, then surgery is really not needed. Uh, as far as specifically the outcomes for the adolescent group, um, as I've already mentioned, there's limited outcome data, uh, part of that being because they've caught, been caught between the cooperative trials done in children and adults. But generally, we think of them as having worse outcomes. And so this was kind of the mantra that was taught to me as a resident. And so I wanted to look to see if that was really true. And so one of the places we first looked was a uh, long-term uh, retrospective study of our institutional experience in Dallas at UT Southwestern. And what we found was that uh, I went into this kind of doing what you're not supposed to do when you do these studies, right? I, I, I thought I knew what was going to happen. I was pretty sure I would see that the adolescent patients would do worse than the children, and they would perform like the adults. But surprisingly to me, not only did they uh, do worse than the pediatric patients, but they actually did worse than the adult patients as well. So their event-free survival was, was statistically significantly lower than both of those groups, both on an overall log rank analysis and also in a pairwise comparison. And then that's been more borne out by further follow-up of the children's oncology group data where they had patients that, with metastatic disease that were treated with chemotherapy. And those patients that were 11 years or older, their event-free survival was lower than historic counterparts. And so the takeaway from that is that currently the thinking with COG is that adolescents are undertreated by pediatric regimens and should be treated like adults. What's interesting, though, is that all those numbers we've coded up until now have been event-free survival. So uh, basically whether they recur or not, not on whether they survive overall. What's interesting in looking at large administrative data, so the SEER data, what you find is that adolescents actually overall do better than adults when you look at overall survival. And uh, you know, unclear exactly what that is, but I think maybe a, a silver lining to the message, while their first line of therapy may not be as successful, uh, overall, they're salvaged very effectively. What are the hurdles for why these patients don't do as well? I think one of them is lack of awareness. So uh, I don't think that any of the providers that are taking care of them mean to not necessarily give them the effective therapy. It's just that they may not know about it. Uh, there's definitely the issue of inadequate health care coverage, especially in the environment that we're dealing with you know, today. 
There was a period of time where every, and all these patients may have been able to be covered, but that may go away again. Uh, there's also the issue that they reimburse at lower rates, which we'd like to think doesn't affect clinical decision making, but unfortunately does. There's the issue of compliance. As we've already talked about, adolescent and young adult men are not exactly the most reliable group of people ever. If you just ask uh, uh, life insurance people, that you know they're not necessarily you know wanting to sign up these uh, motorcycle driving twenty year olds. Then there's the issue of are they being managed appropriately or are they being referred appropriately? And then uh, the issue of translational research. There's really nobody looking specifically at the tumor biology in these patients. Is it different than maybe their pediatric or adult counterparts? And then we'll hit uh, highlight very briefly here in a moment the low rates of clinical trial uh, participation. This is some data that we looked at because I was really interested in this idea of referral patterns when it comes to this po patient population. And I wanted to see, well, how does it vary if these patients are managed in the community versus at a tertiary academic medical center? So we got three or four institutions together and we looked at patients and we looked at, well, did they get referred at the very beginning? So after orchiectomy, but before any other care? Or did they get referred after they had already kind of started therapy someplace else? And what we found was that there was a statistically significantly lower event-free survival for the patients that were referred in later. Now, that's, this study's fraught with tons of biases. They probably got sent in later because they weren't doing as well in general. But the thought is that uh, for these more rare type entities, it's probably best that these patients get managed at a large tertiary academic medical center. As we talked about just a minute ago about clinical trial participation, this is a testament to how well uh, pediatric oncologists do with enrolling patients in clinical trials. So uh, around a third of patients before puberty are enrolled on clinical trials. However, that starts to really dip during adolescence and in adulthood, it's, it's quite low. So that may explain part of why we see the gap in adolescence. So what can we do in the future? I, you know, I always uh, hate it when there's a talk and somebody says, well, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is why there's a problem, but they don't offer any solutions, what we can do to make it better. So you know, how can we improve this going forward? Well, one is, as we're developing uh, in the Children's Oncology Group the next round of studies for germ cell tumors, we're gonna aggressively recruit patients up to age 30, so start to capture more of these patients. Uh, we wanna do these as intergroup studies through the NCTN so that just because you're maybe even 31 or 32, you're an adult cancer center, you're not seeing a pediatric person, even though COG may be run running the trial, we would have it available for all, all ages of patients. Uh, we can work to lobby expanded age criteria, as I've already talked about with the Alliance Tiger trial that's out right now. But in general, as far as the take home message from this talk, I think that um, the experience in adolescent and young adult testis cancer is, is not unique. It's probably typical for most adolescent and young adult oncology patients in general. I think we need to understand more about these patients, understand some of the unique factors, whether that be tumor biology or whether that's socioeconomic, whether it has to do with you know, who's helping to take care of them, how do they get to their doctor's appointment, what's the impact on these patients. You're talking about men that are just finishing, say, high school or starting college, starting their career, starting a family. They're at a very vulnerable uh, period in their life, and so we need to take into account those socio-psychosocial uh, uh, parts as well. And again, because you're dealing with a group that may go see a pediatric provider as opposed to an adult provider or vice versa, there needs to be better collaboration across that span. And then, you know, I think the answer to most of these questions in clinical medicine is just better research, uh, looking to see if we can understand it better to close this gap. And I think that'll really have, uh, help to have a better clinical trial participation. So I appreciate your attention and, uh, and interest. And uh, if you ever have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact me. Thanks, Thanks. So we've got time for a few questions. I may ask one here just as, well, John, why don't you ask the first question? Fantastic. There's eagerness in the crowd, Nick. They want to... Yeah, so So, you know, one of the interesting 
biologic things about testis cancer is that it really represents a continuum. So you start with these kind of in situ precursor cells and they go through this maturation process with embryonal carcinoma being one of the most immature elements with teratoma being the most mature. And it goes through that process. But what we see in adolescents is it's very common for them to have a pure embryonal carcinoma tumor. We know just clinically that patients that have a higher percentage of embryonal carcinoma in their primary are more likely to have metastatic spread. So I think some of it has to do with that, that in that age range, they're most likely to have the element that is most likely to spread. Um, I, I think there's no question there has to be some hormonal milieu that's driving this, right? I mean, why would it change from when they're eight to when they're 13 or 14? So, I mean, you know, it, it has to, as far as how much we understand about that right now, it's very little. Uh, one of the other things I think why we see adolescents presenting in metastatic disease if you just looked at the natural history of the disease, if you waited long enough, it would metastasize. And I think that there are some preliminary data that adolescents are more likely to wait longer to present. So I think that's part of it as well. Are there specific molecular markers that you guys look at? It's all, you know, you discussed clinical staging. I'm just wondering if yeah. that next step farther, are there certain for, you know, for prognostic, et cetera, markers that you look at? Unfortunately, um, as far as molecular markers, there's not a ton of data. There, there's some people, uh, a guy specifically in the UK that's looking at a, a couple of microRNAs that appear to be more uh, sensitive and specific even than the, the hormonal markers we use right now with AFP and beta HCG. Um, but as far as there's not been a ton of work into that, and all of our prognostic factors at this point are, are very clinical. They're where the metastatic disease is, um, how high are the level of AFP or beta HCG? So uh, I think that there is interest in, in uh, doing more work there. It's just, this is a pretty rare thing. There's only nine or 10,000 men a year in the United States diagnosed with testis cancer. And um, you know, the money follows where things are more common. And, and it goes back to advocacy. There's not a ton of people advocating for doing more research in this area. Uh, so. I'll ask a question. Um, it, so one of the unique fe features here is it's a very young population. Think of all oncology, it's a young population. There's also this very high chance of cure. So one of the things that's always fascinated me about testes is the survivorship issues. I have been asked, I haven't thought, you know, I mostly see 20 and 30 year olds, the 15 year old and the, the 16 year old. So what do you think of the special survivorship issues that these folks have to deal with, particularly chemo, surgery, radiation, yeah. that sort of stuff? Well, I, I mean, I think it's, um, it's difficult because there are some that regardless of maybe what their true age is, you see a 22-year-old, and I can see them, and I think they're gonna get a lot better treated at Children's where they're gonna have three social workers and somebody hounding them to come to their appointments. Whereas like I've had, uh, Liz and I have shared a couple of patients that are one that was 18 that I can remember very specifically, got diagnosed, had his orchiectomy, and got arrested three days later because he was you know, trying to steal a camera to go take to the hospital to take a picture of his newborn baby. So that's a very you know, unique social situation. He probably would be better managed at children's, but you see some 15, 16 year olds that are super mature that don't wanna be coddled that are better as adults. Um, so there's those immediate issues, but then there's also the data that the, the Scandinavians have done a lot better than, I, than we have, that they follow them forever. And we use this term cure a little loosely because if you look at overall survival curves, You've seen that data from Sophie Fawcett. They, they come back about five or 10 years on age match controls. And so all this stuff that we do to them makes them live, live a you know, shorter life. Also, there's a one to 2% rate of suicide in these patients. And so if the cure rate from the disease approaches 95, 96%, but then one or 2% of them are dying because of suicide, then we should be just as aggressively treating their uh, mental health as we are with their physical health. And I would say, a third, if not half, of my like stage one talk with these patients has to do with their mental health and you know having our social workers see them and and all that kind of stuff. So, any other questions, Professor Glode, emeritus. <laughs> they yep, they do, and, and part of the reason why is the difference is. Um, adult testis cancer, it's still germ cell tumor. For adult ovarian tumors, they're no longer germ cell tumors. They're epithelial tumors, right? So they, they get treated totally differently. And even the adult gynecologic oncologists are not necessarily that comfortable with germ cell tumor management. And uh, 
another part of the, you know, just kind of as the organ works, even though they're all made up of germ cell tumors, because of the, they, they have a spread like other ovarian tumors right there in the peritoneum. They spread by drop metastasis. They get on the omentum all over the uh, inside of the peritoneum. So they don't have this controlled metastatic pathway like testis cancer does. So I think that's part of the problem as well. No, not really. Um, I don't, does TGCA, does it have testis? I don't think it does. Um, I mean, there are known differences, I mean, very gross things, but like a prepubertal germ cell tumor generally does not have an isochromosome 12P, whereas adults will. So sometimes if you're on the fence, say if there's a pure teratoma and a patient's peripubertal, we'll look for that. But as far as a true driver, um, I've seen people looking for that, but no hard data. I mean, part of the thought is, is that they respond so well to chemotherapy because they don't have accumulated mutations. You know, it's an, most of the time it's an embryonic type tumor as opposed to, you know, a carcinoma with all these accumulated mutations. I'll ask one last question. I mean, so, Nick, you live in a different, an interesting place in that you're in the pediatric hospital, adult hospital. So, for example, the pediatric hospital does very, very well in clinical trial accruals. So, from your perspective, maybe just in general, but also the trials, what could the adult providers learn from pediatric providers in terms of approaching the thing with success? Well, one of the things that is interesting just in getting involved with COG is that they view every disease, every patient as an opportunity. So they, have a, they open trials in a different way. Like they'll open a germ cell tumor study that will have a stratum for every patient. As opposed to on the adult side, you're going to open a trial to look at a specific issue. And some of that's just a numbers issue. You can't do that for every adult patient. Uh, in every stage of disease, whereas for children, I mean, it's a for them to have the malignancy in general is rare, and uh, and so there's so much still that can be learned, and I think there's some zeal there that may be lost sometimes with adults, but um, it's just a culture. I mean, they they I think pediatric oncologists feel it's incumbent upon them to get that patient enrolled on a study if it's there. I don't. I think here we're better about that than out in the community. But still, even, you know, it's, it's um, a work power, manpower issue. You know, you just don't have all the hours in the day to focus on that if you've got so many other patients to just take care of. Well, that's great. Thanks so much. Appreciate your Thanks, talk. Guys.